Okay, hello, dear polyglot. So sorry for um, so sorry that we started a bit later. So we had some technical pro problems, but I'm very happy that you came here to listen to my presentation. So um, again, my name is Sofia Sarkisova, and I'm a master's degree student at the University of Guanajuato in Mexico. And today I would like to share with you a part of my um, master's research project that is titled um, Complexities of Identity Formation, Life Journey of Self-Discovery. Uh, but before starting, I would really um, like to thank uh, the organizers of this polyglot gathering. This is my first time here, but uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. So I hope you also had an opportunity to join different language uh, practice rooms and practice your uh, languages. Uh, so as I already told you, uh, this presentation is going to be about uh, my master's degree research project, a part of it. And I guess before starting, it would be a very important to uh, share the motivation behind this research. Uh, so I decided to conduct this research because um, I had this intrinsic motivation. So uh, myself, uh, you know, being born in Turkmenistan and then uh, immigrating to Russia and having lived in different countries such as Armenia, the US and currently living in Mexico. So um, quite often I get this question, you know, where are you from? And uh, when I say that I'm from, um, that I came from Russia, uh, the natural question, oh, oh, so you're Russian, and then I have to explain, well, I'm Russian and Armenian, and I was born in Turkmenistan. Um, so for some people, it's quite complicated to understand how come uh, this could happen. Uh, so a lot of people still think that, you know, if you are uh, from one country, that means you're the same nationality, you know, the same ethnicity. But obviously, this is long not the case anymore because we live in a globalized world. Uh, so there are many people immigrating. There are many people uh, being multilingual, bilingual, and so on. Uh, and I also found myself, you know, struggling with my identity for quite a long time because I felt that I was somewhere in between. You know, I couldn't fully identify uh, with. Uh, um, so if I talk about my ethnic identity, I couldn't fully identify with my Russian or couldn't fully identify with my Armenian identity. So I felt in between. And uh, then I was wondering. Um, if anyone else felt this way and how identity uh, and language is connected. Uh, so today we're going to talk mostly about identity, different kinds of identity and what it means to be uh, multilingual, what it means to have multilingual identity, multicultural identity, um, how multilinguals use their languages and so on. So let's start with identity. So what does it mean? What does it mean? What does this phenomena mean, right? Uh, so it's very interesting uh, because it depends from the perspective that you look at um, identity. Uh, obviously, there is a sociological uh, and psychological perspective. So if we look at identity from psychological perspective um, uh, and uh, the, the concept of multiple identities, you know, uh, this is something to be treated usually. This is a, a problem, a psychological problem if a person has uh, multiple identities. So uh, today we're going to look at identity from sociocultural perspective, okay? But originally the term was introduced in psychology uh, by Eric Erickson. So uh, the way we know identity now has been introduced by uh, uh, this great scholar. And uh, he wrote a couple of works uh, connected to identity. 
So identity uh, is identified by many researchers as something very complex, as something developing, uh, something very fluid. Um, this phenomena with a very complex and multi-layered structure. If we look at it again, as I already told you, from a sociocultural perspective, there are two different kinds of um, identities. So there is a personal identity, which is a set of different um, different identities that one person can have. And this is very subjective because we're all different. Uh, each one of us is going to have a different set of identities, very unique to every person. And then from here, uh, people can have different primary and secondary identities. So um, these would be also different depending on a person. Uh, so for some people, these the primary identities would be identities most mostly in most of the cases that a person was born with, uh, or the identities that he or she thinks uh, play a great role in their life. And um, as a secondary identity, most of the times it's presented by a professional identity because a prof one's professional identity can. Uh, change throughout the life and it's more uh, more prone to change uh, than primary identities. But of course, it's going to depend on a person and it's going to be very subjective. And talking about social identity, this is basically, um, you know, this different social groups that we belong to. And um, the base of the social theory is that people like uh, to belong to a particular group. Uh, it's in human nature. And uh, when we find this group uh, that we enter and that we identify with, we become the, the member of the group. And then the people who belong to the same group, they are our in-group members. Uh, but the people who do not belong to the same group as we are or belong to other groups, uh, they're usually identified as out-group members. So there is always this uh, distinction between in-groups and out-groups. And uh, social identity theory uh, explains very well such um, notions as discrimination, um, labeling and stereotyping. So it happens that once people um, find their group or identify themselves with a particular social group, they start to um, have some uh, prejudice against the, uh, the, the out-group members, which can lead to the uh, such, to such phenomena as discrimination, labeling, stereotyping, and so on. As I told you before, there can be different levels of uh, different levels or different layers of identity. Sometimes they're called uh, multiple identities that a person can have. So these multiple identities could include um, uh, gender identities, ethnic identities, national identities, professional identities, linguistic identities, and uh, religious identities. There are actually a lot more than what I have listed here. So many different kinds of identities. So today we're going to concentrate mostly on a linguistic identity that a person can have. Uh, but before that, I would like to speak a little bit about um, uh, multicultural and multilingual identities, okay? So what does it mean uh, when a person uh, can have these identities? What do they mean? Well, uh, originally, uh, these notions have been uh, investigated in immigrants because when immigrants move uh, from their home country to a host country or to a host society, um, they bring their culture with them, right? And they bring their language also, but at the same time, they need to fit in. So they start, um, um, they start to uh, identify with this host 
culture also and with the host language. Uh, in order to survive, they need to understand how the host culture works, how the uh, to know the host language. So then at the end, uh, most of the immigrants, um, they have this uh, two cultures or two languages that they identify with, or sometimes even more. Now, the person uh, with multicultural identity is a person who uh, identifies himself or herself with different cultures that he has been exposed to. So it's not just being exposed to different cultures, but actually identifying yourself with these different cultures. So this could be people who um, come from mixed ethnicities, like I already told you, I could be uh, an example because um, I belong to two ethnicities, Russian and Armenian. So um, I'm a person with a multicultural identity or sometimes uh, these people are also called people with hybrid identities. So they have two identities, right? Uh, that's why they're called people with hybrid identities. Or in this case, uh, it would be a person with a hybrid multicultural identity. And uh, if we talk about people with multilingual identities, these are people who identify themselves or think that the languages they speak um, define them. So they're very important for their identity. And um, uh, so these people could be uh, people who are um, international students or exchange students, people who work abroad or refugees, immigrants. So usually these kinds of this kind of people are people who can have multilingual and multicultural identity. Um, then, uh, you would ask me, so who is a multilingual person, right? Uh, so a multilingual is a person who can speak, um, well, there are different definitions. Uh, some researchers say that a multilingual person is a person who can speak more than one language. Other uh, researchers say it's a person who speaks more than two languages. Then there are some researchers who say, um, it can be also people who understand more than two languages. Others say, no, it's people who can speak more than two languages. So you need to be very careful um, with, with, with the definition and uh, with, the, with the kind of authors you um, cite when you investigate these things. So um, I'm going to go with uh, Pavlenko and her definition. So according to her, a multilingual person is the person who speaks more than two languages. And uh, uh, then you would ask me, uh, then who is a person who speaks two languages, right? Well, people who speak two languages are usually identified as bilingual people and people who speak more than two languages, multilingual. Then we have polyglots, right? So what about polyglots? Well, polyglots are commonly um, identified as people who speak more than five languages. And the difference between multilingual person and uh, a polyglot is this conscious desire to learn languages and this fluency uh, in the languages that a person can speak. So um, polyglots are usually uh, more fluent in their languages um, than multilinguals, and they have this um, conscious desire to learn languages, to keep learning languages, right? So it's not something uh, accidental, you know, you happen to uh, being born in this country and you happen to, uh, and it happened to be that your family speaks another language and that's why you're multilingual or that's why you're bilingual. But with polyglots is this conscious desire, you know, I want to learn these languages, I want to speak these languages and I'm going to dedicate this amount of time and I'm going to be fluent in the languages that I speak. So this is the main difference. Now, coming back to our topic, 
uh, multilinguals can experience different things. So a multilingual language use is a very interesting topic. One of these things is uh, language shift. So language shift is basically changing from using uh, language A to using language B. And um, originally, language shift have, has been investigated in big communities, countries, societies. And an example could be um, post-Soviet countries. So uh, when they were part of the Soviet Union, they mostly used uh, Russian language, right? But then uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, when this uh, post-Soviet countries became independent, they came back to using their national language. So there happened this language shift from using one language to uh, shifting and using um, a different language. Um, but uh, right now, recently, uh, this language shift is being investigated also in multilingual individuals. So not only in communities, not only in the context of uh, countries, but also in multilingual individuals. And again, it could be people who are um, who are international students or people who are refugees, immigrants, uh, people who work abroad. So because they move to another country, um, they happen to use another language now most of the time. So another language becomes a dominant language um, of their communication. Uh, another interesting phenomenon that can happen also is um, language attrition. And some researchers say that language attrition is the next stage of language shift. So first, there is usually language shift, and then there is language attrition. So again, language attrition has been initially investigated in the context of big communities or countries. And uh, um, a common example that is given by researchers is indigenous languages. Um, so we know that a lot of indigenous languages have been uh, extinct, uh, unfortunately. Um, so because the colonizers uh, came and then they sort of imposed um, this language of um, colonization on these native speakers, um, First, they shifted from using their indigenous language to using this uh, language of the colonizers. And then with the time, um, they stopped using their native language completely and it led to uh, language attrition. Um, so also now the language attrition is being investigated in uh, multilingual uh, speakers. Um, and uh, the reasons for the language attrition could be very, very different. Um, so the first and very obvious reason is that a person stops using uh, the language. And uh, because he or she doesn't use the language for quite a long time, um, he forgets or he or she feels that, you know, he doesn't remember the language anymore where a lot of it is forgotten. Um, also, it could be that there are some negative memories connected to the language. Maybe a person was discriminated in this language or there are special memories connected to the language. So um, they've been participants. There was a participant of one study who said that he used to um, speak a particular language with his grandma. And then with, when his grandma passed away, he felt that he couldn't use this language anymore. So they had this special bond and the special bond was through this language. So when she passed away, he felt that he couldn't use it anymore, that it was too special. And uh, that's why he didn't use it anymore. So there is a special, uh, you know, um, a reason connected to it. Sometimes it's also, as I told you, negative experiences. So there were um, some um, Jewish people who lived in Germany 
uh, uh, when it was in Nazis, Nazis Germany. And then uh, after World War II, they felt like they couldn't use German anymore. So even they had the knowledge of German, they, they felt that they didn't want to because of this negative experiences yeah, that they had um, to go through. Also, something that is not really connected uh, to, you know, looking at language from sociocultural perspective, uh, but more from um, looking at it from the uh, medical point of view, I guess. It could be also that people have um, some speech problems. So maybe a person had a stroke or a very... Um, very bad accident and then this person just can't uh, speak the language anymore so this can be also a reason for language attrition and also something that is very important language attrition can occur in uh, l1 or in, in l2 so l1 is a native language of the speaker and L2 is a second or foreign language. So language attrition can occur in both cases. And moving on, we have code switching and code mixing, also very interesting phenomena. Uh, and um, sometimes it, it is being confused and uh, sometimes some of the elements can be um, uh, used uh, interchangeably by some of the researchers, and I, I will explain you which ones and why. So uh, generally speaking, um, this difference, you know, uh, between the code switching and code mixing is on the level, the level of the text. So it happens on the level. And if we talk about code switching, it's usually this, um, uh, this switch from using one language to another but it can be also different dialects or different registers so it's not just languages that you know we know uh, like spanish and english just you know changing from spanish to english it could be also different registers you know um, official language uh, colloquial language or academic um, so that could be also switching code switching so uh, a person could switch from using a colloquial language to using um, a colloquial English language to using uh, academic English language and then there are also different dialects different variations of the same language so it can it could be different um, variations of English so a person could switch from using um, American English to using British English or Australian English or um, Canadian English and so on. So this could be also referred to as code switching. Uh, with the code mixing, the level is different. So it's not anymore the level of discourse, but um, a level of a sentence or even within the same word. But here we need to be very um, careful because this is where this controversy comes uh, because code switching can also have um, these two different, there are two different kinds of code switching. So it's subdivided further by many researchers as um, uh, intersential inter and intrasential. Um, Sentential, sorry. So it's sentence, intersentential and intrasentential. So if we talk about um, uh, intersentential code switching, um, this is quite um, clear. It's just, you know, um, pronouncing one sentence in one uh, language or one dialect, one register, and then the next sentence in another one. But with the intrasentential code switching, this is where it gets mixed up with code mixing because it's within the sentence. And as I told you, code mixing sometimes is also defined as this um, as the switching uh, within the sentence level 
or within the same word. Uh, so then here you also need to be very careful who are who you're citing, what kind of authors, and um, this is very important to understand this difference. Uh, so as I already told you, an example that I have here, for example, on the slide, which says iskribiste to reaction paper, could be both qualified, depending on the author that you use, as code mixing, or intra-sentential code switching. Um, so why code switching and uh, code mixing happen? Why do we do that? Well, it's a very complex topic, so there are different, very, very different reasons to it. Uh, usually, um, the ones that are uh, listed by many researchers are uh, this um, a switch of the context. So when there is um, a switch of the context, people can also, multilinguals can also code switch. So for example, if I take uh, my classmates who are mostly uh, Spanish speakers, during the break, they could, during the break between um, our classes um, in master's program, they could be using their native Spanish language, but once um, they have to come back to their classroom, uh, they would switch to using English. So they know that there is a, a different context now. So they're not in their um, previous context when they, you know, just speak with their friends, a very relaxed atmosphere of a break, but now it's a classroom. So because of this uh, change of the context and the master's program is in English, they know that now they have to change to using ling English language. Also, it could depend on the collocutors. So if you have um, uh, um, collocutors who are also multilingual, so obviously you can go back and forth, but if you have uh, a collocutor that is a uh, multilingual and uh, before, let's say you've been talking to someone uh, who knows, um, well, let's say again, let's take an example of my classmates. So if uh, my classmates are speaking uh, Spanish and then um, an international student uh, comes by and he or she doesn't know Spanish but knows only English. So let's say he is he or she is a monolingual. So then they would obviously, if they know English and Spanish, they would have to uh, code switch and they would uh, speak English, you know, to be respectful to a person so a person can actually understand them. And um, so then here it depends on the collocutor, on the person who you speak with. Also, it can depend on different purposes and goals. So if you uh, want to show that you are also uh, a group, an in-group member. So if you want to show to, um, I don't know, if I hear living in Guanajuato, I see tourists coming from Russia and I want to show them that, you know, um, I also speak Russian, maybe I would start speaking Russian to them and to show, to demonstrate that I belong to their group. Or on the contrary, if I don't want to have anything to deal with these people, maybe I have some negative experiences connected to Russian language, even though I understand it, I might pretend that I don't understand and not say anything. So again, it depends on many different factors, different goals, different purposes, contexts, and collocutors. So here you need to be very uh, careful. And then uh, coming back to code mixing, um, usually code mixing is uh, uh, viewed this, you know, as um, a change of codes within one word. And then I have an example here, which is spunita. Uh, so as we know, spoon is an English word, but this uh, ita is a diminutive suffix, Spanish diminutive suffix. Uh, so here we can clearly see this code mixing within one word, right? So we use different languages in one word. 
And this is actually very common in multilinguals. Um, I don't know if you ever experienced um, anything like that. Uh, code mixing or code switching would be very interesting to see your comments. So feel free to comment and uh, it would be very interesting for me to see these examples. Um, so because we started quite late, I wouldn't like to, you know, take any more time. Uh, so that would be it for my presentation. Thank you so much for coming and paying attention. I hope it was interesting for you. And now if you have any comments or questions, I would gladly answer them. And if in case we don't have enough time today, you can always email me. And there is my email, so you can always email me if you have some additional questions or if you would like to read some of the articles or authors that I uh, showed you. And now let's move to the questions. Um, uh, so the question I have here, so what do we, you guys, most identify as to yourself by your gender, nation, political preference, race, religion, historical legacy, sexual preference, skin color, language? Um, I don't know if this is a question to me personally, because it says so, of what do we or you guys most identify? Well, um, if we, if I were to answer this question myself, I would say that um, this is something that I'm actually uh, um, uh, researching right now with my master's um, thesis project because it's autoethnography. And for those of you who are not familiar with this academic context, autoethnography is when um, a researcher, is, the researcher has basically two roles of the researcher and the participant. So this is exactly what I'm looking at. So I'm um, uh, sort of, you know, examining myself and looking at my own identities. And uh, there with the gender identity, I look at how um, living in this uh, different cultures actually influenced my gender identity and especially gender roles. Uh, so uh, having lived in traditional cu cultures, I've been, uh, um, uh, it, it's been, you know, it had an impact on, on, on me, obviously. Uh, so uh, there's certain stereotypes in the traditional cultures that I've lived in. Um, there's certain expectations from women. Uh, so uh, if you're a woman, you have to, you know, cover yourself. Um, you can't speak too much or you cannot interrupt a man when a man speaks. Um, so these are very, very, very interesting things that we don't even, um, you know, think of, but they're actually happening around us. And then, for example, when I moved to more uh, modern cultures, modern societies, there was like um, this this clash that women, you know, had um, um, the same roles or equal roles to men. Uh, so this topic is very interesting, but um, I don't think I have enough time to um, answer this question completely. But very interesting question. Thank you. So let's look at the next one. Um, do you know Tim Keeley's works on identity and ego? permeability? If so, what's your opinion and vision on them? Um, actually, I met Tim Keeley. I didn't, I wasn't uh, familiar with his work before, but I met him in one of the um, language practice rooms, actually in Spanish, I think in Spanish language practice room. And he told me that he was um, actually investigating something similar and he shared with me his uh, works. So I'm very excited uh, to read and see uh, maybe to borrow something from him, you know, to cite him as an as an author also. But unfortunately, I haven't read it yet. Um, then the next question, can you speak uh, to your experience in Mexico becoming part of that language community? Uh, well, um, when I arrived in Mexico, obviously, um, the first um, that I experienced was uh, a culture shock. Uh, so uh, there are different. There's some differences, obviously, between um, the cultures. So before I used to live, before moving to Mexico, I lived for about six or seven years in Russia, 
And obviously there was something that was very uh, different here. Um, so if we talk about Russian people, they're mostly, uh, you know, straightforward and honest. Uh, whereas here, I noticed that people are very careful with what they say, and they prefer sometimes not to say something. And it was very interesting also with no. So in Russia, people some feel quite fine with saying no to you. Whereas in Mexico, I noticed that people don't like this word. So if... Um, if you ask for something and it's no, they would most probably say uh, maybe, or we'll see, or tomorrow, uh, or their uh, famous ahorita, you know, but it actually means that no, it's not going to happen. But for me, it was very hard to understand this uh, cultural um, difference because uh, I, I would be waiting and waiting for this to happen, but then it wouldn't happen. Uh, something that I think became a part of uh, me, something that I borrowed, uh, borrowed from uh, Mexican culture probably would be smiling. So um, now I tend to smile a lot <laughs> to strangers. So I don't know if I, if when I go back to Russia, it would be uh, a problem. So it probably would be uh, a bit odd for other people that, you know, I smile too much or smile to strangers. Uh, uh, let's see, one more question. What do you think are some good strategies for communities to make people with different linguistic identities feel more welcome? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so um, I would say that uh, it's very important, you know, um, when, uh, when we are a part of this uh, linguistic majority or cultural majority we don't really think of the many minorities that can live in our country and uh, it's very hard to understand what they go through um, unless you have you have experienced something uh, similar uh, so um, if i speak from my point of view uh, i have experienced this many times uh, so when I lived in Turkmenistan, for example, being uh, not Turkmen ethnically, uh, I had to experience uh, some discrimination. And then moving to Russia was also, you know, um, some labeling uh, because uh, I was from Central Asia. So even though I was ethnically Russian, I would come uh, from Central Asia and in my in my passport, it would say where I was born. So obviously, um, I feel that this is something unfortunately natural for um, us as human beings to, you know, identify um, and, uh, you know, uh, distinguish between, as I told you, in-groups and out-group members. Uh, but um, it's it's very important. Uh, first of all, I would say to um, actually accept the fact that there can be uh, minorities within your co country, uh, different cultural minorities or linguistic minorities. That would be the first step to actually identify that they are there and uh, maybe to promote this um, healthy, I would say this healthy um, acceptance, this healthy, um, um, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling with the right word. Um, so just accepting them, you know, not, uh, uh, not discriminating against them, uh, but uh, accept, accepting them the way they are, but that would be uh, very dif difficult to do, obviously. It would have to be on the uh, government level, maybe some programs that would help um, these people to be accepted in the, in the majority, in the, the, the major community. Uh, so it would have be on the uh, on the bigger levels, on the levels of the country, the government, you know, there would be uh, they would have to be special programs for these people to feel uh, accepted. Um, I know that in Canada, there are quite a lot of programs for immigrants 
or for minorities uh, that, you know, help them with the language or with um, feeling comfortable. Uh, so probably we could, uh, you know, borrow some of these uh, strategies or some of these programs. But yeah, I feel that it's very important because this this is a big problem that is usually um, not talked about. So, um, okay, so I guess that's it. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's been very interesting for me to answer all these questions that you answered, that you asked me. And if you have any uh, further questions, I shared my email and I would gladly answer all your questions. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.